League to come forward and speak to us now about the call-up. Good morning. My talk to you today will be about Collop's contribution. The frigid winter of 1922, James Bertram Collop was doing what he loved best, working alone in the lab in the quiet still hours. His wife, Ray, their young daughter, Margaret, their new baby, Barbara, were all down with the flu, along with Ray's sister who'd come to care for them. Bert Collop was therefore relegated to a cot in his lab at the pathology building at the University of Toronto. But this worked out perfectly for him. One night, Collop washed a mash of cow pancreas in increasingly concentrated solutions of alcohol. His goal? To free an elusive principle from the fats and proteins with which it was bound. With each wash of alcohol, more and more impurities were pulled out of solution. Sometime around midnight, Collip increased the alcohol concentration to above 90%. At that moment, a precipitate came out of solution. As a colleague later put it, Collip then saw insulin. Collip ran down the hall to telephone his wife. What does it mean to say that insulin was discovered? Of course, what is usually meant by the discovery of insulin, what is being marked in centenary celebrations around the world this year and last is not so much the discovery of the existence of a hormone in the pancreas, but rather the development of a treatment for people with diabetes. And if that is the case, then when was insulin discovered and who discovered it? 42 years ago, historian Michael Bliss decided to take on the discovery of insulin as a project for his sabbatical. Bliss uncovered layers of mythology and misrepresentation that had accumulated over the years. What he realized he needed to do was to break down the question of who did what and who really deserved credit. In 1921, diabetes was relatively rare, but when diagnosed in childhood, it was rapidly and inevitably fatal. People with diabetes experience ravenous hunger, fierce thirst, frequent urination, and sugar in their urine. The state-of-the-art treatment was a severe starvation diet, but even when patients were faithful to this diet, they could expect to live only two or three years longer. A leading hypothesis was that diabetes was due to a, patient's, a problem in the patient's pancreas, and that if an extract could be made from animal pancreas, it might be used to treat diabetes in humans. There had been an estimated 400 such attempts to make an extract, but no one had been able to make one pure enough that it could be safely given to humans. In October 1920, Frederick Grant Banting was a surgeon recently returned from the battlefields of the Great War. He conceived what he thought was a novel approach to making an extract to relieve diabetes. Driven by this idea, he persuaded John James Rickard McLeod to professor of physiology at the University of Toronto to provide the facilities and resources to let him test his hypothesis. Banting began his experiments in May 1921, guided by McLeod and furnished with laboratory space, dogs, and a student assistant, Charles Herbert Best, a new graduate in physiology and biochemistry. By August 1921, Banting and Best succeeded in making an extract that lowered the blood sugar into pancreatized dogs. For these two young researchers, this was an important accomplishment. But in truth, several other researchers, about whom we will hear more later, had already done as much or more. That is, Banting and Best had, had, not, al had not done anything that had not already been accomplished and published by others. They had all made pancreatic extracts that affected diabetic symptoms in experimental animals or in human patients. All of these extracts, however, contained impurities that caused harmful side effects, such as fevers, chills, and abscesses at the site of injection. What no one had been able to do, what remained the holy grail, was to make an extract that could be used safely and continuously to treat a person with diabetes. What the Toronto team now needed was a good biochemist. Enter James Bertram Collip. 
Collip was born in Belleville, Ontario, and studied at the University of Toronto. As an undergraduate, Collip became so captivated by the research ideal that he gave up his plans to study medicine and pursued graduate studies in biochemistry. He was awarded a PhD in 1916 and joined the faculty of the University of Alberta in Edmonton. By 1921, Collip was a seasoned experimentalist. Through the war years, he managed to eke out time for his research, even though his teaching load was heavy and resources were scarce. Summers with his family were often spent at the Nanaimo Biological Station, where he collected starfish, jellyfish, lampreys, and snakes for his research. And after the war, he spent a stimulating summer in Britain, which triggered a flurry of 17 publications on respiration, adrenaline, and osmotic pressure. In 1921, he was awarded a Rockefeller Traveling Fellowship, and he and his young family arrived in Toronto to begin their year of leave. Collett met Banting in McLeod's office around May of 1921, and he offered his help. And in December, things were going so well that Banting asked McLeod to invite Collett to join their work. What happened in the next six weeks would be remarkable. Collett set to work systematically and quickly. Since he was accomplished in doing much with little, he was soon able to find ways to speed up the research. By this date, the team met every day for lunch, so it's likely that McLeod also contributed key suggestions. Collip found that he could use normal rabbits rather than depancreatized dogs to test the strength of his extract, which meant he had a much less expensive and more readily available test subject than Banting and Best had. He adopted a new method of blood glucose analysis that allowed quick, convenient measurements with a small volume of blood. And in rapid succession, Collett made several key contributions. First, he proved that the extract reduced ketones in the urine. Second, he showed that it allowed the body to convert glucose into glycogen in the liver. These findings were important because Banting and Best had shown that the extract caused a drop in blood sugar. But this in itself was not conclusive because blood sugar can be affected by many other factors such as shock or the presence of foreign proteins. Collip's data show that the extract actually restored the ability of the diabetic body to metabolize sugar. So it's clear that Banting, the physician, was looking for a treatment for diabetes, but the research scientists, Collip and McLeod, were thinking of what they were doing in broader scientific terms. They were not just trying to purify an extract, they were also trying to clarify the chemical nature of a hormone and to understand its role in the physiology of the animal body. Collip noticed that as his extract became more and more potent, his test rabbits became so hungry that they began to eat wood shavings. And one day, a rabbit went into convulsions. At first, Collip thought the extract must be toxic. And indeed, previous investigators had seen this exact same reaction and has assumed the same thing. But suddenly, Collip had an idea. Maybe it was not so much that his extract was not pure enough. Maybe it was actually too pure. He quickly took a blood sample from the rabbit and set it aside. And then he grabbed some sugar, made up a solution, and injected the rabbit. The rabbit recovered. When he later tested the blood sample that he had set aside, he found that indeed there had been almost no glucose in it. Collip had discovered the hypoglycemic reaction. A colleague who was in the lab at the time said, it all looks simple now, but it was the most thinking per square meter per minute that I have seen. Collip was the first to correctly identify the hypoglycemic reaction when dangerously low levels of blood sugar occur after too great a dose of insulin is given. And this finding served as an important warning to physicians who would later use insulin. For Collip himself, this month felt incredible. In early January, he wrote to Henry Marshall Torrey, president of the University of Alberta, saying, the crucial experiment was tried out just before Christmas break, and the results were so striking that even the most skeptical would be convinced. I have never had such an absolutely satisfactory experience before, going in a logical way from point to point into an unexplored field, building absolutely solid structure all the way. We have obtained a mysterious something which, when injected into totally diabetic dogs, completely removes all the cardinal symptoms of the disease. 
At the moment, it is my problem to isolate in a form suitable for human administration the principle which has such wondrous powers, the existence of which many have suspected, but no one has hitherto proved. To be associated with the solution of a problem which for years has resisted all efforts was something I had never anticipated. But tensions among the group were growing. Banting insisted that they, do a, that they do a clinical trial using an extract that he and Bast had made. On January 11, 1922, Leonard Thompson, a 13-year-old boy with diabetes, was um, injected with their extract. The results were disappointing. No clinical benefit was observed, and what's more, a painful abscess formed at the site of injection. Years later, Banting would acknowledge that their results that day had not even been as good as those of Zulzer in 1908. In the days that followed, Collip threw himself into the purification problem, following standard biochemical procedures to mash, wash, filter, and centrifuge the extract. And on January 19th, he, using um, fractions of increasing uh, concentration of alcohol, he found a way to trap the anti-diabetic substance in a semi-pure form. Collip wrote a few days later, the problem seemed almost hopeless, so you can imagine my delight when about midnight one day last week, I discovered a way to get the active principle free from all the muck with which it appeared to be inseparably bound. Four days later, his extract was tested on a Leonard Thompson, this time with dramatically different results. There were marked improvements in blood sugar and urinary sugar and ketones. The boy felt stronger, brighter, and more active. This was the first unambiguously successful clinical use of a pancreatic extract in a person with diabetes. In six weeks, Collip had accomplished what, other what had eluded other researchers for decades. Collip's achievement was a key breakthrough for the Toronto group. And when Banting and McLeod were awarded the Nobel Prize in 1923, Banting immediately announced that he would share his prize with Best. And McLeod followed suit by sharing his with Collip to indicate he felt Collip's role had been equal to that of the rest. But as the years went by, the discovery grew increasingly associated with Banting and Best alone. Collip, who left Toronto in 1922, and McLeod, who returned to Scotland in 1928, as we've just heard, were increasingly left out of the story. At Toronto, chairs, buildings, and research funds were named after Banting and Best. But for decades, there was no trace of McLeod, one of their first two Nobel laureates. In 1982, Michael Bliss's definitive history of the discovery decisively changed that narrative because of his compelling argument that insulin was the result of the teamwork of Banting, Best, Collip, and McLeod. In the decades since, this interpretation has become widely accepted. In later years, Bliss argued Collip's purification of the extract was the single most important step in bringing the whole enterprise to a successful conclusion. And he said he regretted that he had not been even more explicit in arguing that Collip probably should have been included in the award of the Nobel Prize. Collip's midnight breakthrough is a marvelous story, but it is also somewhat misleading. The romantic notion of science as filled with flashes of inspiration and eureka moments of discovery fails to capture the reality of science in the 20th, in the 20th century. The development of a pharmaceutical product such as insulin was actually the result of the sustained collaborative effort of many researchers and institutions. Collip would modestly say that he had only done what any good biochemist would have done. And there is certainly a lot of truth in that. What is even more to the point is that he always recognized that the endeavor had been collaborative. Bliss urged us to appreciate that the insulin discovery did not come out of thin air. He used the metaphor, the field of medical dreams, paraphrasing the baseball movie's promise, if you build it, they will come. Collip was a good biochemist. 
and he was in the right place at the right time. But he also had the right tools, resources, and collaborators. A comparison with the discovery of penicillin is instructive. In 1928, Alexander Fleming discovered the bacteria-killing effects of the secretion of a particular strain of mold. But his discovery lay untapped for more than a decade. It took the work of Howard Florey and Ernest Chain and their colleagues at Oxford to turn it from a curious observation into a therapeutic agent. And the combined efforts of hundreds of workers and several pharmaceutical companies under the emergency conditions of World War II to solve the problem of mass manufacture. In contrast, the insulin collaborators are able to get their life-saving product into the hands of doctors and patients in many countries around the world the following year, a breathtakingly short time. My fellow speakers today and tomorrow will be elaborating many of the factors that made the University of Toronto a well-prepared field in 1921. This included well-equipped laboratories and the well-trained personnel who could take this work um, and produce the body of evidence needed to convince the scientific world of their findings. It also included industry collaborators who worked out the problems of production, clinicians who partnered to help understand how it could be used in patients, and administrators who facilitated it all. I'd like to highlight just a few of these factors. For one, Collip was a graduate of the same honors physiology and biochemistry undergraduate program at the University of Toronto as Charles Best and Clark Noble. This program had been designed to train an elite stream of medical students in the methods and ideals of scientific research, and it was one of the most progressive preclinical programs in North America. Historian Sandra McRae argues that it rivaled graduate programs in the US for the rigor of its training and many of its graduates would go on to become leaders in medicine throughout Canada and the United States. And as we can see, several were key players in the insulin story. Second, large-scale philanthropic funding by the Rockefeller Foundation was also important. In 1920, the Rockefeller awarded $5 million to support medical research in Canada, uh, sorry, med medical education in Canada. This gift helped to construct new buildings, hire staff, and introduce full-time clinical teaching. The largest grants went to the older schools at Toronto, McGill, and Dalhousie, but even the newer school at Alberta received funds. And of course, it was a Rockefeller Traveling Fellowship that brought Collip to Toronto in 1921. Third, an interesting pivotal role was played by a new laboratory technique. Micro methods of blood sugar analysis would give the Toronto researchers a significant advantage over those who had come before. Banting and Best were able to use the 1916 Myers-Bailey modification of the Lewis-Benedict method. This was an advance over previous methods which had been quite laborious and required drawing up to 25 cc's of blood, which meant that if you wanted to take samples over time from a particular animal, you would have to practically desanguinate the animal. And that summer, while Collip was at Woods Hole, he learned the even newer Schaffer-Hartman method of blood glucose analysis from biochemists at the next bench. This technique had been published just that January, and it allowed Collip to use as little as one or two cc's of blood, which could easily be drawn from the ear of one of his rabbits, and it could be done repeatedly without harming the animal. The technique involved just a small number of relatively quick steps, removing proteins through precipitation, oxidizing sugar by adding a copper reagent, and then measuring the sugar through a very quick iodometric titration. Titration has a simple, clear endpoint, the sudden disappearance of a distinct blue color in the solution. This method was quick, delicate, and well-suited to measuring small quantities. Once Kolp had learned it, he refused to use any other method and it allowed him to quickly evaluate batches of extract and get prompt feedback on how strong they were. But Collip's breakthrough was really just the beginning. Capitalizing on this breakthrough came about only because McLeod was able to throw the resources of his department behind the effort and coordinate with many clinical and industry partners. Scaling up production of insulin was no simple matter. 
For several months, Collip found that he could no longer make insulin, and it was only through the sustained efforts of a team of researchers that such early problems were overcome. It would be a monumental task to get from Collip's aha moment to producing a safe, standardized version of insulin, one that could be manufactured on a large scale and relied upon to keep people with diabetes alive, injection after injection, day after day, for the rest of their lives. Collip went on to become one of the most eminent figures in Canadian medical research. At McGill University, he headed a large, thriving team that produced work of international significance in endocrinology. He was a leader in shaping the federal funding of medical research through the National Research Council, and he ended his career as Dean of Medicine at the University of Western Ontario. As for the discovery of insulin, at times, controversies would erupt as historians questioned the Banting and Best mythology. Collip always refused to be drawn in. He said, I pretty well managed to avoid unpleasant arguments. Personally, I'm quite happy to let the insulin story stand on the publications by the group who collaborated in 1921 to 22. So who was responsible for the discovery of insulin? I think the last word rightly belongs to Collip himself. Years later, the philanthropist, the philanthropist Gladys Mutart wrote to Collip to tell him of her plans to donate a Wurlitzer organ, and she wished to engrave a plaque with the words, in recognition of the contribution of James Burstrom Collip to the discovery of insulin. Collip replied saying that he was deeply touched, but he asked for a change of wording. Instead of the discovery of insulin, he substituted the development of insulin therapy for diabetes. He explained, although I have been guilty of using the word discovery on occasion myself, generally speaking, I do not like it. Most so-called discoveries represent simply the last but important step in a long series of previous steps, representing the contributions of many others through the years in the scientists' search for truth. As we celebrate the centenary of insulin's arrival, we are sure to slip into using the word discovery, but let's not forget the far richer history of collaboration that is contained within that term. Thank you. Thank you.